people. I I was just making a list of the things that I've served on. I've been a PTA president. I've been a member of a school community council. I've been on a district budget committee. I've been on this. I currently serve on our elementary schools school accountability committee. And I served for three years with our district foundation as well. Um, at the school where I'm teaching now, there's an advisory council I could serve on. And actually, our city has an arts council that is made up of volunteer community members as well. So everywhere that you live, there's some way for you to be involved in the community, represent your school well, and make a favorable impression with your administrators. You are listening to the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, where we teach music educators how to build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. Welcome to episode six of the Music Ed Mentor Podcast. I am your host, Elisa Jones. You can follow my music education blog at professionalmusiceducator.com, and I invite you to join us in the online Facebook group, Music Educators Off the Podium. This is the second of our two-part episode where we are talking all about one of the most important aspects of your career, your relationship with your administration. In a recent study by grad student Elizabeth Kinsky on music teacher burnout, her results show that 49.2% of the music educators polled don't feel that their administration supports them. That's more, almost half of us don't feel supported. And of the top 10 responses as to why teachers experience burnout, six of them cite issues with their administration. It's just absurd how important this relationship with our administration is. So let's continue with my co-host, choral director and composer Bruce Rockwell, as we share more of 10 ways to make your administration love you. Let's jump in. All right, so quick review. Uh, Number one, represent the school well. Number two, come to them with solutions or at least options, not just problems. Number three, make them feel special. Number four, stay positive no matter what's going down. And number five, don't play the versus game. Ready for number six? Absolutely. All right. This is a, I love this one because we both have been on, you know, committees with budgets and stuff. Be money conscious. Cha-ching. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. love, I love asking for things that don't cost money. Yeah, that is, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. And the money thing is a little different for secondary because- we can raise our own money, I, I think, a little bit more more readily and easily. We have a built-in way of raising money. We can charge admission for, for, for the concerts. And I, I you know, I was kind of surprised when I started in this, this um, capacity to learn how bitterly opposed on philosophical grounds some, some people are about charging even even a um, like a suggested donation at, at, at the door which leaves it completely up to the the people whether or not they want to support your your program but but we can charge admission we can have fundraising events and and uh, you know so we have that at our event plus we have the big this labor pool of students who can go out and do fundraising events yeah that's true and and, and so um, that we we do have a way of of raising our own budgets, and I, I think that the the days when we would just get a five figure budget to you know take our band on trips and you know buy buy instruments and you know those days are are kind of probably gone for good. But if you can develop the entrepreneurial side of your program. I think there are a lot of benefits to that and it probably will depend on your community. I, I think your, your, you know, your ability to raise money is probably going to be dependent on the, the median income in your community. So if you're in a wealthy community, you're going to be able to raise a lot more money uh, than, than in a community that's, that's you know, blue collar or, or whatever, but it's always going to be some kind of a factor of the, median income. 
So, you know, you can always, always do something and, and it, it, it helps to just take responsibility for that part of it and just not expect that that's going to come raining down on you uh, from the administration. Mm-hmm. Right? Even though it should, right? Even though it should. <laughs> it, 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 in an ideal world and in really wealthy districts, uh, it, it does. But, you know, I've got, we've got, we've got around here in the Bay Area, we've got some of the wealthiest communities in, in the country. And, and I've, I know the directors and some of them and they get, you know, a couple hundred dollars a year from their, from their um, budget, from their school budget. Right. And they raise everything else everything else that they do as, as fundraisers. And we have that, you know, I mean, if we, if you looked at the, the, the fundraising as a, as a kind of a grid, you know, we got these grids with quadrants and, you know, if you could imagine the up or down portion being, you know, how much money you can raise and then the left to right portion would be whether or not that fits into the educational mission of your organization. You want to be doing stuff that's up in the upper right hand, a quadrant where it has the maximum potential to raise money, but it's also within the uh, mission of your organization. You know, like Mm -hmm. we we have a a Renaissance feast dinner that we put on every year and that's extremely educational and it's a good fundraiser. We have an Italian music, excuse me, an Italian dinner show where we decorate the place like it's an Italian restaurant. We do all Italian music, Italian madrigals. We do Italian opera choruses. We do you know music from the Rat Pack and Dean Martin, all this stuff. Uh, it's totally fun, very educational, and it raises a lot of money. You know, so but then so you want to keep away from the the stuff that's in the lower left quadrant, which would be the stuff that doesn't raise a lot of money and that isn't in your your uh, mission at all, you know, like a bake sale or something. Right. And I would say even to that, stay away from things that cost you money to raise money. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a big advocate for grant writing just because, you know, it can, you can even find a parent who will help you do it and it costs you nothing to apply for grants. So for elementary teachers, you know, get, first of all, go after all the stuff you can for free Mm -hmm. and then write grants. Yeah, I would say yeah, fundraising, awesome. like you said, if if it applies to your program, if it fulfills your mission then, and can raise you money, I think that's brilliant. But if it detracts from your mission and is is a fundraiser and is not an advantage to your students in any way, but just money, then and it costs you money. Why would you do it? Yeah, exactly. No, and, and grants are another way because gr- another uh, grants don't don't require any expenditure of human capital your, your your students don't have to spend one minute on it uh and and if you have if you have the you know the education foundations i mean your best your best sources of grants are your local education foundations and you know we uh, we have a uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have a, a music education foundation that, that grants to local school music programs you know those are your best best bets you know it's a little harder to get the national grants and you know the, by the grammy awards or you know fender <laughs> yeah. guitar or whatever always, you, always start in your realm of influence and work yeah. outward that's what i always say yeah and you've got some great great uh, resources for for grant writing for music educators oh thank you i've I, it's it's something that i think everybody needs to know and everybody kind of feels a little scared about it so i've tried to make it nice and easy for everybody yeah yeah. So that takes us to number seven, mitigate risks of conflicts before they happen. Mm-hmm. You know, make friends with your fellow teachers, be mm-hmm. understanding of their points of view. And I just love this one. I mean, it helps that like my three bestie friends are also teachers at my school and the teachers at my school, I work, I've, I've worked to just support them as much as they support me or even more because I find that the more I support them, the more that they understand that I'm there for their students, you know, the yeah. more they in turn support the crazy things that I ask them to do for our music programs. <laughs> yeah, I like to think of it in, um, and I forget, I don't know who I got this from, but I like to make deposits, right? The, oh, right. How full is your bucket? Rep- Exactly. You make deposits with people. It's like an account of goodwill where you make deposits. So, you know, and every once in a while you can take a withdrawal from that when you need to call in a favor or something. But if you're, if you're 
making a lot more deposits with your colleagues, your administration, then they're going to be, um, then they're going to be a lot more supportive and, and, and cooperative when, when you need to take a withdrawal, when you need to call in some favors. So, yeah. And I think sometimes we forget that our most powerful advocates, other than, you know, of course, the parents of our, our own students are the other teachers in the school. Mm-hmm. You know, if yeah. there's something going down in the music program and another teacher stands up for you, I mean, how, how powerful is that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so build those relationships and mitigate risks of conflicts with your team members. And my yes. other little bit of advice, this is one of my little soapbox things, right? Um, really remember that it's about the students. You know, those, their classroom teachers, especially for us elementary teachers, you know, we sometimes feel bitter that we are their prep period, you know, and we're treated like we're their prep period or whatever. Um, but really, it's, it's about the students. And if you can make the students love music and expand their learning, they will do better in their own classrooms. They will be better behaved. And the teachers will be more excited to drop them off. And, you know, it just yeah. makes a huge difference if you remember that it's really about the students. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I guess it was Quincy Jones in the recording sessions for We Are the World. He put a big sign for these big you know, recording stars. He said, please check your ego at the door. And I think <laughs> We have to do that as as administrators. I mean, excuse me, as as, as educators. It's so uh, true, and it's to, hard because we're all performers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have egos. We have egos, but we need to exercise that muscle of, of checking them at the door and and you know not saying things that we want to say. We got to bite our tongue, <laughs> but but mostly, I think it's just we got to spread goodwill, and we can. You know, we've got these amazing students, and we. What we do is amazing. Yeah. So we can spread goodwill so that, we, again, we, we mitigate or, or reduce any kind of risk of, of any kind of conflict with other teachers, especially. So that brings us to number eight. Do what they ask you to do when they ask you to do it. Mm-hmm. And this should kind of go without saying, because you think in, in a normal job, right? Like I have all this experience working in music retail. If my, my, my boss paid me the same hourly, no matter what my job was, if he asked me to go rearrange the stock room, I would, if he asked me to ring up somebody for a $10,000 violin, I would do that. If he asked me to go to Sam's club and buy him a package of pens that he liked, I would do that too, because that was my job is to do what he asked me to do. And our administrators are our bosses and we should treat them the same yeah that's right exactly <laughs> do, if they if they're taking an interest in you and asking you to do something you're right it's uh it's in your best interest to do it unless it's something that's going to damage your program right you know if if, if you know because a lot of times you know we have to understand that we're the ones who understand music education we're the only ones who do and we can't really expect our administrators to understand it the way we do. So they're going to make decisions sometimes that aren't going to make any sense um, from, from our standpoint. So, you know, I, I guess I would say that, that we don't always have to do what they do, but we do have to communicate well the reasons so they see why why it would not be a good idea if we did, you know, what they were asking for us. So. Right. But if, if it's within our means and we can do it, that's like, like you said, we're building up in an account for them. Sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You're we're adding, a adding to that. So exactly. That mm-hmm. actually leads right into number nine, which is be the authority and show it. So when, when your ensembles and your students and yourself are super successful, Share it. Let people know you are the authority when it comes to music education in your school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and this yeah, it, this goes into some of the areas we're talking about about um, you know communicating to them all the positive uh, emails that you get from from parents. Just you know, we get these a lot. You know, you know, at the end of the year, especially. Oh, thank you so much. It's meant such, you know, it's meant the world to have, you know, my son in your, in your, in your choir program. It's just meant 
it's been night and day difference from from back when he was in you know our old school. They didn't have a choir. It's just been amazing. Blah blah blah. Did he blah? And you got to take those and you know uh, forward those right up right up the river to the administration. So they so they see. Um, and uh, so again, it's not just about being the authority, but 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 you being being uh, willing to share that. Um, to share that the successes from that. Yeah. And con- consider this, if they were the person who hired you, you know, and they made the decision to bring you on, then any positive feedback that you get, that's just reinforcing their decision. And yeah, that's going to make so. them feel good too. That's right. Yep. Mm-hmm. I love that. Mm-hmm. I try and tell my principal all the time that he was so smart to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. So that, that number 10, well, let's just review and then we'll get to the last one, which is going to kind of wrap us around to what we started with. But number one, represent the school. Well, have a quality program and get it out there in the community. Number two, come to them with solutions, not problems. Bring to them options for what you want. Not just, you know, fix this for me. Number three, make them feel special. Number four, stay positive no matter what's going down. Number five, don't play the versus game. Be supportive of the other programs in your school. Use that to your advantage. Number six, be money conscious. Number seven, mitigate the risks of conflicts. Number eight, do what they ask you to do when they ask you to do it. You know, except for those caveats that we talked about. And number nine, be the authority and show it. And finally, number 10, maintain your data. So this brings us around to what we started with is just keeping that data at the forefront of your mind so that you can answer questions whenever they are posed to you. Yes. Um, And I do this thing called the State of the Choir report that I do at the beginning of every year to to share with my my principal. And that is... um, you know, just a quick rundown of all the sort of important points that that um, you know that, that show the growth of the choir program. You know, mainly it's enrollment numbers. You know, I put a nice little chart of you know shows the enrollments going up. Um, you know, the the booster, uh, what the boosters have, have done, what our budget is, um, and we how we, how we do in our in our adjudicated festival that, that we do, um, you know, the charts, you know, the, the improvement over the years of, of that. Um, so, you know, kind of all these, these, these data points that are important, I, I'll just I'll keep it in a document and then update it every year and, and get it to my administration so they know what's going on, you know, so that they can see, you know, we have a new principal last year. Well, he didn't, he hasn't seen me go from like 30 really, um, uh, disenchanted students to, you know, 120 students who are totally bought in and who love what they're doing. You know, he hasn't seen those years. Right. So right. He, do, he doesn't really know. He doesn't, he doesn't know. He doesn't see the scope of that. So I have, I make sure that he, he knows what's going on and he knows the quality of program that we're running. Yeah. I think that's, that's brilliant to have, you know, an annual, thing that goes out to your administrators. And I would say book that into your schedule. You know, I like every spring. That's when you update all of your budgets. That's when you update all of your inventory, you know, for instrumental teachers, when your inventory goes into the shop to be repaired or cleaned or whatever. um, That's when you should, you know, figure out those numbers and count your music library. And I love keeping tabs on all of your students too, because then if there's a problem with a student, which honestly is like, I feel like 90% of your principal's job, right? Is dealing Mm -hmm. with students. Mm -hmm. Then you can pull out that data for students in your classroom. Even, you know, I've had students who were struggling in other classes, but doing stellar in mine. And as soon as I got wind of it being, you know, this student is so-and-so and and so bad in so-and-so's class, I'd pull out that data and be like, hey, but they're great in music, you Mm -hmm. know, and that makes a huge difference to them. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a place where they have success. Exactly. This is one of the most powerful things that we have and we might take it for granted because we know that. I mean, we know that our, our students have success because they all have to be successful, right? I mean, I was trying to 
explain this to 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 um, someone the other day that our students all have to get A's. <laughs> you know, when by the time the concert roll rolls around, I, I've got to get everybody to the level of the top students in other classes. Everybody has to be there because we can't have anybody singing. You know, with with uh, at a C level when because you hear that, <laughs> right? You know, um, so we got to have everybody. Uh, has to be at an A level, and so we know this. So we, uh, but uh, but we, it's just uh, a powerful thing about what we do. We the students find success in music that don't find any success at any other part of their day, and um, you know you see this when we go into IEP meetings, um, where where the student. Uh, Often it's really the only enjoyable thing that they that they do, and I also get some students in in my district. We uh, the students can do independent study so that they can you know kind of be homeschooling. But but the one class that they will want to take is is the choir class. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's because they have success in there, and it's a social class, and and um, and they feel good in there. So. It's just a very powerful thing that we do, and it's important for the for everybody, not just your administrators, but also your counseling staff. It's important for them to see that kind of to see that benefit. Right. It's it's one of the big biggest things you can do to advocate for your program. I love how this all kind of ties together. You know, we go from from budgeting to you know dealing with your administrators and collecting data, and it all comes down to advocacy, which is one of the most important things that we can do for ourselves, right? Yes. yes, in yes, many, many ways and advocating in many different directions. So let me just review the 10 ways that you can make your administrators love you. And then we're going to have a couple additional points at the end here. But number one, represent the school well. Number two, come to them with solutions, not problems. Number three, make them feel special. Number four, stay positive no matter what's going down. Number five, don't play the versus game. Number six, be money conscious. Number seven, mitigate risks of conflicts. Number eight, do what they ask you to do when they ask you to do it. Number nine, be the authority and show it. Number 10, maintain your data. And I would just say, if you really, really want to do well with your administration, if you can get involved outside of your school in something that happens with the district, whether it's a committee or, you know, anything, anything, go to the school board meetings, you know, get involved outside of your classroom. That's going to get you so many bonus points and it's going to help you understand better. You know, if you can get your, I've heard of a lot of music teachers getting their administrative certification. Absolutely. And that totally puts you to the forefront. And not only will you have kind of the back door into the admin, but you're going to have greater insights than you've ever had before. And that's going to help you with all of these issues. Yes. I think it's really important to get music educators into various roles of leadership, both at the sites, at the schools, you know, a school will have a site committee or a, you know, staff senate or, you know, something like that. Um, And oftentimes you might not see people from the visual and performing arts on those committees, but it's important to to have our voice there. Um, And also at the district level, like you said, uh, you know, not just going to school board meetings, but, uh, you know, in California, we have something called the LCAP, which is the, the local control and the local control and accountability plan, which is basically how we budget. And, and it's designed to allow the local communities to have a say in what the schools or how the schools are going to spend their money. And it's a very important for California music educators to get on their LCAP committees and, and, uh, and communicate what your needs are and get the parents to show up and get everybody to rally around the, the important things that, that you want to see. Um, because you know, the, 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 the sports parents are going to be at the table. So it's important to get the music uh, people at the table. And at my district, we have, uh, we don't have what we would call a, 
a VAPA coordinator or a, a music coordinator, which would be a, an administrator, you know, someone with a, an administrative credential working in the district office and, and, and helping make decisions around music curriculum and so forth. We don't have anything like that. We haven't for 15, 20 years. And I think a lot of districts are in that, um, in that position of a sort of leaderless where, where the, the teachers are putting it all together themselves. And a lot of times the district makes decisions that don't really jive well or don't support music well, not, not because they don't really care, but they just don't have the expertise to make these decisions. So we have a, um, we have a steering committee that helps make these decisions and that, that advises, and we're working on what's called an arts plan. And this is a strategic plan that our board is adopting and our superintendents are signing off on, on how to build the, the, um, you know, K through 12, uh, arts programs. And, and so, uh, it's, and it's making a huge difference already. Now we have this, uh, we have a graduation, um, creative arts honor roll that, that we implemented so that the students in high school that stay in creative arts classes for four years, they get a, a special honor at graduation and, and they get a, you know, they're on an honor roll that they can use on their college applications, you know, so we've already implemented this and we're going to be doing some more stuff going on, on down the road, but but it's just so important to have people representing music educators at the table when important decisions are made. So you have to understand where those important decisions are made and mm -hmm. you have to be at the table. Yeah. Right? And, and not only that, they will want you at the table. I've, yeah. I was just making a yeah. list of the things that I've served on. I've been a PTA president. I've been a member of a school community council. I've been on a district budget committee. I've been on this, I currently serve on our elementary schools, school accountability committee, and I served for three years with our district foundation as well. Um, at the school where I'm teaching now, there's an advisory council I could serve on. And actually our city has an arts council that is made up of volunteer community members as well. Mm -hmm. So everywhere that you live, there's some way for you to be involved in the community, represent your school well, and make a favorable impression with your administrators. Yeah, and you're a mover and shaker, and that's awesome. <laughs> but you have a finite amount of hours in your day, right? Well, I didn't and do them all at once. That's I just know. for my last 10 years. <laughs> exactly. But you have lots of colleagues around you mm -hmm. that can serve on these committees. And the more you get people, you know, to serve on those committees and to bring the the voice of of music education and the needs of music music education to those committees the the greater you're going to have the greater impact that's going to have on on your your students and, absolutely and get get the retired music teacher to run for school board yeah do that yeah <laughs> that's exactly yeah all right so that kind of wraps up our list i'm going to have a lot of links and goodies in the um, show notes for this episode. So make sure that you follow that. Get on the Smart Music um, blog and follow them as well. That's where you're going to get all this good stuff. So I have one question for you, Bruce. Can you share with us your eight-week run-up plan for your concerts? Yeah, I can I can give you a copy of that. Sure. Would you be willing to do yeah. that? We would love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. And then also, if people want to find out more about you, connect with you, your your music composition stuff, where are the good places they can go to get introduced to you? Well, right now, I'm sort of in between uh, websites. So so my composition stuff isn't on, on a website as of yes. Yeah, it'd be brucerockwell.com. But um, uh, but my, my choir program is collegeparkchoirs.com. Um, that's, uh, you know, you can kind of get a sense of, of what we're doing from our Facebook page. It's, uh, just college park, um, college park choir, college park high school choirs is, is the public Facebook page. And then we maintain one that is just for, for, uh, students, you know, my current students where we, we do a lot of communication about, about things that, and, and that's, um, that's different. But then oh, there's also. I'm so also, glad you do it that way. I'm just going to interrupt because I did an episode a couple episodes ago about marketing music education. We actually talked about having an outward facing Facebook page and an inward facing Facebook group. So well, that's there awesome you go. that you're doing that. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, great minds think alike. But CPHS Choirs is our Twitter feed. And, um, you know, so you can kind of follow and get a sense of what we do that, that way. Um, but anyone can, can email me if you're, if you're interested about the, the creative arts honor program, I would, that I sort of proposed that and, 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 and fought for it for, for like two years to get it to actually happen. Um, that can happen in any district. It's, it's been amazingly powerful for retaining students and, and recognizing their, their work, um, and recognizing the worth of, 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 uh, creative arts. And I could share my information about that because you know it costs next to nothing for the student for the for the district to buy some some honor cords for students um and to maintain this this uh the honor roll on on the on the student on the district's website but uh so if you want information about that i'd be happy to to send well thank you so much for being my guest host for this episode and it's been just marvelous chatting with you oh well thank you so much for for uh for having me. It's been my pleasure and I hope it's very helpful to uh, gobs and gobs of, of music educators out there. <laughs> well, that's the goal. That concludes our 10 ways to make your administration love you. And I hope that you were able to glean some great ideas that you can start applying right away. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends and followers. We're all in this thing together, and the more great advice we can share, the better off we all will be. You can access the show notes for this episode and past episodes, as well as all the downloads by going to professionalmusiceducator.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to leave comments with your advice on how to make your administration love you. You can also find the show notes, including the downloads, on the smartmusic.com blog. Just search for episode 006. Bruce has even shared with us his pre-concert promotion schedule for you. While you're there, why not sign up for your free teacher account and give Smart Music a try today? My tip for you when it comes to using smart music for assessments and really for all of your student data tracking is to create files for each of your students where you can save their recorded assessments or photos of their written assessments. At the end of the year, you can simply email a copy of the file to their parents or share a link to a shared folder so they can see how their student has grown over the year in your class. It's carrying data like that, tracking it, and using it in the future in discussions with your administration, that will make them love you. So make sure you do it. Thank you again so much for listening. It is a total honor to be offering you these resources and support. Thank you for subscribing and leaving us reviews on iTunes. You guys are the best. In a couple of weeks, we'll be returning and talking all about marketing your music program with Cla Kathleen Hewer. You won't want to miss it. Until then, keep teaching on. <laughs>